Of all the characters that are set to make an appearance in God of War Ragnarok, Odin is perhaps the one that I am most anxious to meet. In the state of play Sony held in September, we were told by director Eric Williams that Odin will indeed play a big role in the story as the Allfather of the Realms. Actor Richard Schiff was cast to do the performance capture and I very much look forward to seeing him bring this character to life. According to a recent poll that was held by Santa Monica Studios Twitter account, people are overwhelmingly more excited to visit Asgard than the other realms and it's no surprise. Odin is central to much of the tension surrounding God of War's Norse saga and the topic I will analyse in great detail is how he has been the vehicle for departing from the principal sources of Norse mythology. Those of you familiar with the Eddas will know that the Prose Edda in particular is not viewed as a perfectly reliable source because it was written by a Christian, hundreds of years after the Norse culture died out. There are also passages in the Poetic Edda written from the perspective of Odin, though the Prose Edda is the one that receives a lot of the attention because it has most of what we know about the tales of the Norse world and its gods. In the run-up to the release of God of War in 2018, a recurring motif was that of unearthing pages of the Prose Edda that were lost to time, notably because of the large gap of almost 600 years between the manuscript being put together and the displacement of Norse culture by Christianity. Its weaknesses as a source have been leveraged to deviate from its writing and the context for doing so is provided within the established law through Odin. In order to understand what I'm getting at, one only needs to look at the creation story. The triptych carved by the giants reveals Midgard and the World Tree already existed before Odin partnered with brothers Vey and Vili to murder their father Ymir so that he could fashion the realms for himself. Odin would have you believe that it happened the other way around. It is written in the Eddas that the Allfather and his brothers were stuck in the void of Ginungagap and only the primordial realms of Muspelheim and Niflheim existed when he killed Amir. The murder of Amir was made out to be necessary to escape the void and use his parts to build Midgard when it was actually to fashion the realms in the way that he saw fit. The first panel of the shrine tells us that Amir was the first being who ever existed, back when there was no earth or sky. Amir sprung forth when ice and fire met from Niflheim and Muspelheim. The first man and woman, ask an embler, came from his armpits and the first Jotun is depicted below. In the triptych dedicated to the story of Burgomir the Beloved, we can see that he found a way to stay afloat in the middle of the flood of Ymir's blood after he was murdered by Odin. To the left you can see his wife Null and they sailed together to a distant land where they founded Jotunheim. The giants were born again in large numbers and they lived a life of merriment from love, not from violence nor vengeance for the death of Ymir. Some of you may remember finding a prayer in Midgard that was written by a human to Odin, and it said the following. Find here our sacrifice, mighty Allfather, and deliver Midgard from Hell's wild hunt. Odin, wisest of all, whose breath gave life to ask an embler, first among our people, we beg your protection. Reading that in conjunction with this triptych carved by the giants suddenly adds a whole new dimension to this prayer in the confirmation of Odin spreading false myths. Since Odin did not give life to the first humans, what reason would he have to protect humanity? Moving on to the second panel, we are told that Ymir used parts of his skull to create the sky and his hair to mould the world tree. His sweat from doing so formed the sea and the world of Midgard was moulded around his flesh. Ancients supposedly came from Amir as well, which is not at all surprising given their name, and have therefore been around since the beginning of time. Scanning the far right reveals that from Amir's legs, the ground subsists. Dwarves were given life from the ground's dirt as the triptych displays their evolution from a worm. According to the Prose Edda, it was Odin and his brothers that created the father of dwarves as a maggot using Amir's blood and bones. The Aesir later gave him a more humanoid appearance and human-like intelligence. This was not the case at all according to the shrine. Similarly, Odin would have you believe it was he who discovered the runes after he pierced himself with his spear Gungnir and hung himself by the neck from the world tree's branches for nine nights without food or drink. In truth, the runes seem to have come from the Nornir who used them to carve the destiny of every living being and he seems to have bled into the well of destiny for the wisdom of the workings of fate, linking back to my theory on why he is so obsessed with the giants. 
Despite learning many secrets while roaming the realms of the dead, the knowledge of runes does not appear to be one of them. They seem to be taking a very grounded approach with Odin, who is more flawed in comparison to the Odin we know from the Norse myths and legends. Though Mimir regards him as being extremely clever, he does make a passing comment about the Raven King not being as smart as he thinks he is. He is supposed to be the god of knowledge and wisdom, so I was initially disappointed about his failure to deduce that Kratos was the ghost of Sparta, but then I realised the legends exaggerated his feats and abilities, as they do for most figures. Even though his name already translates to the Mad One, the Odin of the God of War universe still feels more twisted by Ragnarok in comparison to the Odin of the Eddas, but this works within its parameters because of the parallels that can be drawn with Zeus and Kronos. The irony is that their efforts to control fate end up bringing about the very thing they tried to prevent, and the tale of Skoll and Hattie is told as an effective means to convey this. Ragnarok begins when they devour the sun and moon, yet Odin is the one who puts them in the sky to chase them, because he believes the Aesir stand a better chance at survival if they are under the control of his magic rather than being free. If the wolves determine when Ragnarok begins, and Odin controls the wolves, he therefore has control over Ragnarok, at least in theory. Like Kronos and Zeus before him, he becomes a victim to legitimate fears as people do when they act on insecurities. Fear of losing power, wealth or both can ultimately create tyrants that want to control as much as possible. I suppose this is what made Norse mythology such an alluring choice, in that it granted the opportunity to put Kratos in a world that is all too familiarly building up towards the end with his family at the forefront, and a king of the gods stepping into the fear-stricken shoes of Zeus. Kratos is clearly very agitated about having caused Fimblewinter for this reason, and you can therefore understand his preference to avoid war with Asgard. Ever since Kratos broke Faye's protection stave, Odin's ravens have been spying on Kratos and Atreus, with his famous companions Hugin and Munin circling their home after the start of Fimblewinter. In the most recent trailer, Mimir mentions that Odin has tricks up his sleeve that they haven't dared to consider. We know that Odin has some sort of plan thanks to a couple of scrolls from the Raven Keeper, and that it will revolve around Ragnarok and stopping it from happening. With respect to sealing off Svartalfheim and Asgard, we are told the following. The realm of the dwarves is secured. For a promise of security from the rovers of hell, they have made Asgard custodian to their borders. Now the Vanir will have no hope of Svartalfheim's aid, thanks to Odin's foresight. The elves remain sufficiently distracted. All plans proceed. It is done. Asgard's defences are impenetrable. All means of access have been cut off save for those in Odin's power. The plague of the dead will not touch us, nor shall we fear any Vanir aggression. Words of this must reach noble Thor, for the time approaches for his part in the Allfather's plan. Shortly after the death of his son Baldur, Odin sealed access to all of the realms in the realm travel room of Tyr's temple, which actually means that Kratos and Atreus can no longer use it to traverse the Yggdrasil. The means of transport that they used to get to all nine realms in God of War Ragnarok remains a mystery for now. Because of Groa's prophecy, Odin believes that the giants are the agents of Ragnarok and he thinks he can stop it from happening if he kills them all. When they all fled back to Jotunheim 170 years ago because of Thor's rampage with Mjolnir, Odin became paranoid that this was to amass an army in Jotunheim in preparation for Ragnarok and the opportunity to exact revenge on the Aesir. The story of God of War Ragnarok could further elaborate on his hatred for the giants. As I postulated in part 1 of my lore analysis for God of War 2018, it is highly likely that the fates of Norse mythology are giants. The link for that video is in the description below if you are interested in that theory. The Traveller religion was created by Odin to conscript warriors unknowingly into finding a path to Jotunheim. When we run into them on the journey to spread Faye's ashes, they are on a quest to search for clues that will help Odin reach Jotunheim. Baldur was also manipulated into hunting Kratos after Odin promised that he could break Freya's protection spell if he persuades Kratos to take him to Jotunheim. Technically you could say that this was true, and Odin had this level of foresight because of a triptych that he managed to spy on during a visit to Jotunheim with Tyr, under the pretense of forming a peace pact with the giants. 
that triptych would have featured the journey Kratos takes to spread Faye's ashes, where he no doubt would have been called Farbauti. Odin is also known for causing wars and conflicts to happen among men so that he can collect the best soldiers and put them in Valhalla to train for Ragnarok. The Einhoyar he didn't send to Vanaheim wait in the Great Hall of Asgard for Odin to call upon them to fight on his behalf. His obsession with the inevitable demise of the Aesir was why Odin was so keen to learn the ways of Sather magic from Freya. During the great war between the Aesir and the Vanir, Freya was said to have led the charge as the foremost master in Sather, and she could use it to confuse warriors into fighting one another. Odin has the ability to transform into a silvery hawk as well, and this may have been another thing that Freya taught him. I'd be lying if I told you my heart didn't jump when I saw the bird flying down to Boulder before the final encounter because I thought it might have been Odin. The final straw for Odin that led to the breakdown of his marriage with Freya was when she cast a spell that hurtled both herself and Thor out of Jotunheim when they went to get Mjolnir back from the giant Thrym. Prior to that, Odin had been barred from visiting Jotunheim following the sundering of the Realm Travel Tower and was therefore hoping Thor would be his means to secure access. When he severed Freya's wings and took away her warrior spirit, Sigrun served as the leader of the Valkyries. Due to her underwhelming leadership, Odin sought to seize control over them by conjuring old magic that transformed their ethereal spirits into physical form, a process that inadvertently corrupted them. No one was left to sort the dead, which inevitably led to the gates of hell being overwhelmed and the emergence of hellwalkers on Midgard, in line with the Jotnar prophecy of the circumstances surrounding Faye's return to Jotunheim. We foresee Midgard's fate. Overrun a second hell. Neither Odin nor his dead may reach Jotunheim. The downfall of Motsignir and his kingdom further reinforces one of the central themes of self-fulfilling prophecies, potentially foreshadowing what will become of the so-called Allfather. Motsignir was one of the sons of Ivaldi, the most skilled inventor and craftsman among the dwarves, whom Odin perceived as a threat. The dwarves had learned to craft their works using the mists of Niflheim, but it was Ivaldi that knew how to weaponize the mists using alchemy, much to the displeasure of Odin, because it wasn't something that he could control. The Aesir used it against him when he did not want to yield, and the Aesir Bane made poisonous to them and everyone else shrouds the whole of Niflheim, dubbed by Motsignir as the Curse of Ivaldi. Motsignir renounces dwarven kind after witnessing the trouble they inherently attract from their propensity to craft effective tools of war, and effectively exiles himself to Midgard, where he established a kingdom among men. He was popular at first, until the gods punished him for his father's treasonous actions in Niflheim and gave him visions of his people being slaughtered by beasts. Motsignir could have ignored his dreams despite the belief that they were premonitions, but he decided to act on them and by virtue of doing so, caused them to materialise. His order for farmers to capture every beast possible brought down the whole of Vethegard, and the pursuit of three legendary ingredients to forge the Devagrathika led to his death when he realised that the ingredient of ultimate sacrifice meant his life and not his morality. Moments like these really showcase the cruelty of the Aesir and provide further context as to why some stories were either drastically altered or allowed to become lost to time. Another such example is the Well of Wisdom that was behind Odin's supposed infinite wisdom but never actually existed. What Odin drank from was simply a well that Mimir drugged in order to impress him and Odin saw visions that were so vivid they led him to gouging his eye out. According to Odin's legend, the Well of Wisdom was the second most sacred well of the Yggdrasil that bestowed great mental powers on those that drank from it. Instead of taking his eye out after getting high on drugs, Odin would have you believe that Mimir issued him with an ultimatum, to offer up his eye in exchange for drinking from the well, or leave with nothing. After drinking from the well, Odin says he was able to see farther and more clearly with one eye than with two. It's evident from his behaviour that this is nothing but a mere exaggeration, intended to conceal the fact that he was fooled and to help propagate the myth that he was a god of wisdom. The Eddas posit that Mimir was a giant and the brother of Bessler, which made him Odin's uncle. It is said that he was known to be wise and the guardian of memory, which is actually rather apt considering all the stories that he tells us on the journey to spread Faye's ashes. 
When Atreus picks up a dagger in Tyr's vault, Mimir calls it a Skeendu from his homeland. This is a Gaelic term confirming that Mimir is indeed Scottish and therefore a foreigner in the Norse world if his accent wasn't already a dead giveaway and it simply translates to Black Knife. In his homeland he was known by a different name and his first master was in fact a king of fairies, which were legendary creatures in Celtic folklore. Mimir only decided to head north when the fairy king grew tired of him and the name Mimir roughly translates to the Rememberer, so it makes sense that he chose it after arriving in Odin's kingdom since he wanted to impress him and become his advisor. Before God of War came out in 2018, Corey spoke about the world being a character in its own right. This idea really stretches as far back as Chains of Olympus when Kratos wielded the power of the Ifrit magic whose origin stems from Arabian mythology. Those who watched my videos in the build up to release will know that I had always suspected that they would introduce a character from a foreign mythology. Because they were so secretive about the identity of Atreus' mother, I thought it would be Fae as the maternal goddess Hathor from Egyptian mythology. With respect to Mimir's heritage, we can resolve the discrepancy rather easily. Odin suspected Mimir to be in cahoots with the Jotnar when he advised that it would have been prudent to make peace with them if they really had a hand in Ragnarok. Odin believed Mimir colluded with them in conjuring the trick behind the Well of Wisdom and pulled out Mimir's eye for recompense. Instead of admitting his trusted advisor defected, it would have been easier to simply paint him as a giant. You could still infer that Odin had a great deal of respect for Mimir based on his description in the Eddas. Of all of the central themes in God of War, the theme of dysfunctional families was the one that heavily permeated throughout. The Aesir family are obviously one of its central pillars. Odin killed his father Ymir, Baldur attempted to murder his mother and Thor even succeeded at killing his. Thor's mother was of course the giant Fjorgin and she was described by Mimir as one of Odin's great loves which explains why she was given the title of goddess despite being one of the Jotnar. We have yet to know the full story about what happened to her but I suspect we will find out in God of War Ragnarok with Thor being slated to play a big part as well as Odin. It is implied from her funeral rites that he betrayed and murdered her and Odin's hatred for the giants was likely a factor in terms of it being passed down to Thor. It's said that Odin was left sad and lonely for a long time because of this and I do wonder if he harbours any guilt for what's happened. There is also the unhealthy rivalry between Thor's sons Magni and Modi. Magni became desperate to show he was worthy of inheriting Mjolnir, while Modi carried resentment over his brother for taking the credit for their collective rescuing of Thor from the Jotun Hrungnir and being regarded as his father's favourite soon after that. Modi also suffered terribly at the hands of Thor after Magni's death. In addition to Ve and Vili, the lost pages of Norse myth also mention members of the Aesir, Hynir and Hodor, who we haven't met yet but could very well run into in God of War Ragnarok. It isn't made clear whether Tyr is the son of Odin as he was in the Eddas, but it seems he belonged to the Aesir family nonetheless. According to the third panel of the triptych that the giants dedicated to his story, Tyr was betrayed and killed by Odin and Thor. This was what led to the abandonment of his temple in the Lake of Nine. After Odin became jealous of Tyr's popularity and he correctly surmised that Tyr helped the giants hide the Jotunheim realm tower, he sent the Aesir as well as monsters to attack the temple. As we know from the latest trailer, Tyr is still alive somehow but this isn't a surprise given we never got to see a tomb or a body. Furthermore, I got the vibe from the last game that they justify titling the Norse saga with the God of War name primarily because of Tyr and not necessarily because of Kratos. What's most interesting to me is that the triptychs carved by the giants are known to be very accurate, so Tyr either found a way to fake his death or this is perhaps a depiction of an event that is yet to happen. There is another theory I have that does involve Tyr actually being dead, despite him being shown in the trailer, but I will save it for another video. The theme of dysfunctional families can also be intrinsically tied to the theme of ancestral curses, which is all about future generations having a predisposition towards repeating the same mistakes as their ancestors and being punished for the crimes of the ones who came before. 
it is a key element in the House of Atreus in Greek mythology, which I have already covered in a separate video, but I do suppose it's the inherent nature of dysfunctional families that the same mistakes are repeated in a vicious cycle. You'll also remember from Motsigny's story that the reason he got those visions in the first place was because his father's actions were perceived as treasonous by the Aesir. So how do I expect Odin to look in the God of War universe? Well for one, game director Eric Williams said that this will be a very different take and by that I think he is comparing their depiction to Marvel's version of Odin. The images I could find that best illustrates how I expect him to look are the two I've placed here. I see him as being an old grey haired man with one eye that is dressed in a brown robe, possibly with a pointed or a brimmed hat. I have reason to believe that they will go for a very modest look because Eric also said that he does not live all high and mighty in a castle or anything of that sort. Despite the majesty of Asgard and it being the home of the Aesir, Odin does not spend much time there. One of Odin's names is the Wanderer because he travels around the world on a constant quest for more wisdom and knowledge in the hope of preventing Ragnarok. This is corroborated by the number of Odin's hideouts we can find scattered throughout the realms. What's particularly curious for me about the Wanderer disguise is that it is also very eerily similar to Zeus's disguise as the Gravedigger in the Greek saga, and it makes for just one more compelling reason to choose it. According to the novelization of God of War 2018, Baldur is the strongest foe that Kratos has ever faced. This is most likely because the Aesir are more grounded in their way of life and focus on fighting and feasting. While the Greek gods were certainly no slouch, they were more like politicians living on lavish structures that prefer to manipulate from the shadows and avoid getting their hands dirty. I'm not sure if Odin will be as strong as Baldur because I expect him to be a more cerebral antagonist, but he is known for having a spear called Gungnir crafted by dwarves that is said to never miss a target that it's aimed at. Even if this turns out to be another exaggeration, we mustn't forget that he managed to kill Amir and use his parts to design the realms, so I expect him to be at least as strong as Zeus. On top of that, he is very skilled at practicing Sather and very knowledgeable in the ways of old magic. Throughout the lore, there doesn't seem to be any mention of Odin's wolf companions from the Eddas, Geri and Freki, only the ravens Hugin and Munin. This is not that surprising in light of what I spoke of earlier about Odin being a vehicle for deviating from sources of Norse descriptions and stories. Having wolf companions seems to be Atreus's thing instead, possibly because they are related to him in some way. He seems to have some sort of connection to them because it's written in his mother's diary that the idea of wolves attacking him seemed funny. Moreover, he is depicted with two wolf companions in the mural dedicated to him at Jotunheim's highest peak. My next video, titled The Champion of the Giants, will be a continuation of my analysis of this mural following part one, The Steadfast Guardian, which was dedicated to Faye. Part 2 will be centred around Atreus and the mystery surrounding Loki. With Faye, Odin and Loki covered, please let me know in the comments below which character you would like me to do afterwards. It feels great to finally come out of hiatus and to upload a video after such a long time. I hope you all enjoyed it and I'll speak to you all very soon in the next one.